or video, and I guess they're uh, taping the session. If you're joining us by way of audio or video, we invite you into this class. This is Vintage Bible College. We're teaching today the course, uh, The Deeper Life. We're going to be talking today. This is our sixth session. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I'm calling this session. It comes right out of the text. We're going to read in just a moment. I will give you rest. We've been on rest, been working our way toward rest, as you remember, for the last two weeks. Uh, today we're gonna we're gonna hit uh, front dead center. I, I'm 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 hoping that we can get all this covered today and move on. I got lots of topics uh, to talk about uh, in this, lots of uh, sessions, and so <clears throat> we're, and we're doing okay on time, I think. But today I'm gonna talk about I will give you rest, and so I'm gonna be reading uh, in just a moment uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 11. You can turn with me in your Bible if you'd like. Uh, it's gonna be on your screen. I went ahead and included it in PowerPoint. But um, let's, uh, let's talk about I will give you rest. If you remember last week, let me let's sort of set this up. If you remember last week, we were talking about, uh, talking about rest, and we talked about how Israel failed to enter into rest. We went over to Hebrews chapter 4, and we talked about how they failed to enter into rest, and, and the Hebrew writers, um, you know, urging them, um, you know, enter into rest. It's, you know, it's expedient, so to speak. Um, let a, you know, that you don't let this promise being, have, being left us of entering into his rest that we'd fall short of. So he, he talked about that. We talked about some of the hindrances, and we talked about the fact that God had called them out of Egypt, not to the wilderness, but he called them out of Egypt into the promised land. They got hung up in Egypt because of their own unbelief and hardness of heart. We spent quite a bit of time talking about that last week. We're going to go on into Egypt today, I mean into Canaan today. We're going to talk about, so that they, they were intended to go out of Egypt into Canaan, they wandered around 40 years, which we said last week's for a lot. I see believers all the time. They're wandering around the wilderness, some of them for 40 years or more. 40 years in the scripture was until they all died. So basically all their life they wandered in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb, if you remember, were able to go into the promised land because of their, you know, because of their faith and because of the others' unbelief. We're going to talk about today about entering into that rest. We're going to talk about um, you know, this rest and what it means today. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. It's on your screen. Read this with me. I'll come back and address it more in just a minute. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, Jesus said, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, let me just mention this passage just for a moment first. Context is everything. If you read earlier in the letter, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious folks of the day, that put heavy burdens on them, burdens that they could not bear. And so he talks about that. He contrasts them a little bit with John, whose message was all about Christ and the coming Messiah. And how that, in that chapter, you see that how that even the religious leaders of the day, um, they opposed John. And, and even when John was in prison, they, they, didn't, they didn't give him the time of day, so to speak. Uh, didn't fight him in any capacity for him to be freed. Uh, they were glad in a sense that he was gone. Jesus talks about John there. Then he begins to talk about the heavy burdens that these religious leaders place on the people. And so that's when he says this. He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. We've got lots of things we're going to talk about here. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. I am humble, Jesus says. Um, I am humble and meek. We'll talk about that. And you shall find rest under your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Read one more time. Come into you, all you, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to talk about that today, and I want to begin with, uh, with uh, you know, a pretty long quote from Andrew Murray's book, Abiding in Christ, Abiding in Christ. And so it's an incredible word um, and he talks a little in that, in that book about rest. Matter of fact, he uses abiding in Christ and rest in a sense synonymously. And you'll see that um, as, as we read uh, um, uh, Andrew Murray. Listen to what he says. He says, rest for the soul. That's what Jesus promised. Remember, you shall find rest for your souls. So Andrew Murray says, rest for the soul. Such was the first promise with which the Savior sought, the Savior sought to win the heavy laden sinner. Listen to him carefully. I'm going to try to slow down. I get excited and I want to read fast, but I'm going to try to slow down because every line here is an incredible word. So listen to what he says. Such rest for the soul, such was the first promise with which the Savior sought to win the heavy laden sinner. Simple, <clears throat> though it appears, the promise is indeed as large and comprehensive as it can be found. 
rest of the soul. Does it not imply deliverance from every fear? Listen to what he says. Rest for the soul. Does it not imply deliverance from every fear? The, the supply of every want, the fulfillment of every desire, and now nothing less than this is the prize with which the Savior woos back the wandering one who is mourning that the rest has not been so abiding or so full as it had hoped. I see people all the time like that. They say, you, you said, Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. I've had people say, I have anything but rest. My life is upside down. Believers I'm talking about, I hear them all the time say, my life is upside down. I have everything but rest. I don't have any rest. I don't have any peace. And sometimes in the scripture, rest and peace are used synonymously. you got to know that. So listen to what he says. He says, the Savior woos back the wandering one with, the, with rest, who, who is mourning that, the, the wandering one, who is mourning that the rest has not been so abiding or full as it had hoped. That's Israel in the wilderness, remember? Remember, God brought them out of Egypt. We talked about it last week. They brought them out of Egypt to bring them in too. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy, that's how they say it. You brought us out to bring us in. You brought us out to bring us in. That's the problem. People come out. But they never go in. They, and Israel refused to go in because of their unbelief, if you remember. So they're wandering in the wilderness. And so we know what happened to them in the wilderness. They began to grumble and murmur and complain. I read the passage there from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 last week. And I noted, I pointed out that he talks about the fact that they, were, they began to murmur. It was an ongoing murmuring and complaining. As a matter of fact, that murmuring, complaining, and complaining got the best of, of Moses, if you remember. So, so much that on the second time they wanted water, remember, God told him to, to, smite, to smite the rock the first time and speak to it the second time. And remember what Moses did? He got angry at the people and slugged the rock the second time and said, Here, you rebels, come get your water. And God said, he shouldn't have done that because that rock is Christ and he's only smitten once. Moses, in his frustration, violated the type in effect and so God didn't allow him to go into the promised land he was able to see it and God took him he wasn't able to go into the promised land it's incredible that's where that's where Israel is now they're wandering for 40 years in the wilderness grumbling murmuring complaining feeling like God had let them down feel like he brought them out of Egypt but he did not bring them into Canaan when in fact it wasn't that God didn't bring them into Canaan remember last week week four they were it was 11 days journey from Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, same mountain range, to, to Kadesh Barnea, the southern entrance of the promised land. And they got within one day's journey, sent to spies and then rejected the promised land. And God allowed them to wonder. So that this is who Murray's talking about here, that wandering one who says, God hasn't given me rest. That wandering one, he said, who is mourning that the rest has not been so abiding or full as it had hoped. He's wooing them to come back. Twice he mentions rest here. He'll, Murray will talk about it in a moment. He woos them to come back and abide in him. Nothing but this was the reason that the rest has either not been found or if found has been disturbed or lost again. You did not abide with. You did not abide in him. Strong word. Hear him again. He says, nothing but, but this. People are fussing about God hadn't brought him in yet. That every, it's everything but rest. He says, nothing but this was the reason that the rest has either not been found or, if found, has been disturbed or lost again. Some people have it intermittently. They have a little rest. They don't have any rest. They have a little rest. They don't have any rest. He says, the reason is, is they did not abide with nor abide in Christ. That's this rest. He said, have you ever noticed how? In the original invitation of the Savior to come to him, the promise of rest was repeated twice. Good point. With such a variation in the conditions as might have suggested that abiding rest could only be found in abiding nearness. I like that line. Abiding rest can only be found in abiding nearness. First, Murray says, the Savior says, come unto me and I will give you rest. The very moment you come and believe, I will give you rest. The rest of pardon and acceptance. The rest in my love. But we know that all that God bestows needs time to become fully our own. 
It must be held fast and appropriated and assimilated into our innermost being. There's, it's this growing process in the Lord, just getting to know him, coming up alongside of him or under his wings, so to speak, as he talks about here, this, this rest where we abide not only with him, but we abide in him. This theme just keeps coming up, if you remember, all through here. Israel was brought out so that they might be brought in. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom. Unless you're born again, you won't enter into the kingdom. Lots of people stop halfway. That's what he's talking about here. They stop halfway. They're, they're, they're slamming God, all frustrated and aggravated because their walk doesn't seem to be a walk of rest. When, and they see others around them that their walk is a walk of rest. And then they wonder, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with God? How come God hasn't given me that rest? He tells us. He tells us. Remember, he tells us. Maybe we didn't abide with nor in. So he says, first the Savior comes, says, come unto me and I will give you rest. The very moment you come and believe, I will give you rest. The rest of pardon and acceptance. The rest in my love. But we know that all that God bestows needs time to fully, to become fully our own. It must be held fast, cleaned, cleaned to, and appropriated, and assimilated into our innermost being. Without this, not even Christ's giving can make it our very own in full experience and enjoyment. And so the Savior repeats his promise in, his wor in words which clearly speak not so much of the initial rest with which he welcomes the weary one who comes, but of the deeper and personally appropriated rest of the soul that abides in him. That's why we're called in the class the deeper life deeper life, not just the life, but the deeper life. You know, you, you really choose where you want to walk with Christ. Jesus had the multitudes that followed with him from a distance, remember? Matter of fact, I'll write them on the board here real quick. He had the multitudes that followed with him at a distance. Uh, they, they followed him mainly only because he fed them, remember? He had the multitudes. Uh, remember when, when uh, they, they after he fed them, he got up the next morning left. John 6, they, they tracked him down. They said, Master, why did you leave us? He said, because the only reason I, you follow me is because I feed you. They said, that's not true. He said, then commit to me. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Covenant with me here. They said, oh, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And many turned and followed him no more. So you have the multitudes. You have the 70. Remember the 70? He sent them out two by two. They went out, healed the sick, cast out devils, lay, I mean, it, it raised the dead. They, they did incredible miracles, the 70. You, you got the 12 who practically lived with Jesus everywhere he went. For, for, for three and a half years, everywhere he went, they went with him. He mentored them personally, the, the 12 disciples. Then you, then you got the three, the three, the inner circle of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. When he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he, he left all the others, took these three with him. They were ready for that. The others weren't quite ready for that. They were ready for that. And so they saw the Lord Peter described it. He said, I saw him transfigured before my eyes. They saw the physical, natural body of Jesus, and they saw the, the deity of Christ illuminate out just for a moment. It's almost like this going back and forth, and they could see both his humanity and his deity all at the same time for just a minute. Peter said it was immaculate, it was wonderful, incredible. They're the ones that, when he went into the, into the wilderness to pray, remember? He went in the, wilderness, in the garden to pray, I should say, on, on the night before his crucifixion. And remember, he took all the disciples, and then he took those three closer in and said, watch with me here. So you got the three. Then you got the one, John, at the foot of the cross on crucifixion day. You decide where you want to walk with Christ. Lots of people are comfortable just being in the multitudes. They're, they're just going to wander around the wilderness. That's, that's all they're ever going to do. They're going to wander around the wilderness. I, I'm not saying they didn't come out of Egypt because they did. But they never quite enter into their Canaan, their rest. And so they're sometimes frustrated with God. And you 
decide where you are in this list. Think about it. So go back. He says, and, and he says, and so the Savior repeats his promise in words which clearly speak not so much of the initial rest with which he welcomes the weary one who comes, but of the deeper and personally appropriated rest of the soul that abides in, in, with him. He now not only says, come unto me, but take my yoke upon you and learn of me. It's an incredible word here. Become my scholars. Yield ourselves to my training, yourselves to my training, he says. Submit in all things to my will. Let your whole life be one with mine. In other words, I'm going to live here. Not only abide with me, abide in me. Abide in me. And then he adds, not only I will give, but you shall find rest for your souls. Notice, he not only adds, I will give, but you shall find rest for your souls. Murray says the rest he gave at coming, at, you know, where they came to him, will become something you have really found and made your very own. So that rest that he promises, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, he says that rest that they find at coming suddenly becomes reality to them because they have, they're not only abiding with him, they're abiding in him. Incredible word. The deeper abiding rest that comes from longer acquaintance and closer fellowship from entire surrender and deep sympathy of the Lord. Take my yoke and learn of me, Jesus says. Abide in me. Murray says, this is the path to abiding rest. This is what we got to hear today. We're talking about Jesus. I will give you rest. If you want that rest, listen to what Murray says because he's hitting the nail on the head here. Take my yoke. Learn of me. Abide in me. This is the path to abiding rest. The rest is in Christ and not something he gives apart from himself. So in other words, Murray says that if we're going to really experience his rest, and we're going to see this in a moment. I'll show it to you in the scripture. He's right on. Christ is our rest. He's not just giving us rest. He is our we're not just abiding with him. We're abiding in him. It's, it's, a, it's a deep word, an incredible word, a very important word. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, come unto me, all you that are, labor, that are laboring and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Notice what he says, take my yoke upon you. Well, that seems kind of strange that he would say, I'm going to give you rest. And then turns right around and puts a yoke on him. I'm going to have a picture of a yoke here in just a moment. We'll, we'll look at that yoke. It looks pretty heavy to me. It looks, looks pretty you know, annoying, to be honest with you, in a sense, because you're going, to, you're going to be all bound up with this yoke. And so when you hear somebody say, come into me and I'll give you rest, and then you turn around and say, here, put this yoke on, seems kind of strange. Notice what he says. Come unto me. That's the first call. Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. I dare say every one of us have been there, have labor, heavy laden. I will give you rest. The ones that he's referring to there in Matthew 11 have been under the, 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 the yoke of the law, which is grievous. <clears throat> With the law, the soul of sin, they shall die. The law, the Bible says, Paul says that nobody could keep the law. He said it was grievous and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it was hard to deal with. And so they're weighted down. And Jesus says, come unto me. I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That's a key word. This is what we leave out. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's an important point. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest under your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, when you think about a yoke, I, I, I found this uh, drawing today, I think it will help us to understand what a yoke is. I'm, I think I might have mentioned this class uh, last week, week four. I think it was in this class. I kind of got into it. But notice what Jesus said. He said, take my yoke, number one, but notice what else he said, and learn of me. What you're looking at here on, on your screen uh, is a yoke. You take two, in this case, two uh, oxen, 
and you yoke them together, you got this wooden yoke that goes over, and you can see the, the you know, I can't think of all the terminology here, uh, but you've got the hoop that sort of um, encloses their neck. That, that, that's called a yoke. That's a yoke. Think about it. The term yoke, you look at it, as Jesus is talking about here, is the Greek word zygos. It means a coupling. I want to talk about this a minute. I think it's important. It means a coupling. It means servitude. When you yoke someone up, in a sense, it's a shackle. You, it's, it, it's, a, it's a humbling term. That's why Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. It's an important point. This term yoke means a coupling or a servitude. And, and according to, to A.T. Robertson, he, who's a Greek scholar, Robertson says that it was used to describe submission, and the rabbis used it for school. In other words, you take the yoke, the yoke of learning, the responsibility of learning. That's, that's the, kind of what that word yoke means. So what you do, you did was you yoke two animals together. In the picture that you see here, uh, you know, before without the graphic, um, you take two animals, you yoke them together. Basically how it's done is you take the experienced ox and then you yoke him up with maybe an inexperienced ox. Because he's going to have to train. The experienced ox knows how it goes. He knows the ropes. He knows exactly how to, how, you know, how to plow or whatever they're going to do with him. And so the inexperienced ox comes alongside of him and gets yoked up to him so that he can learn and be tutored by the experienced. Think about what Jesus says now. The lead animal, the experienced animal, is disciplined. He's been doing this on a regular day, day basis. The, the new ox may have never been yoked up at all. He's a little apprehensive. He don't know what to do. He wants to turn and run. But now they yoke him up. Now he's got to go. He's going to be mentored. He's going to learn from his tutor, so to speak. The tutor's disciplined. He's strong. He's been pulling this plow maybe for years. It's old business to him. He knows, the, he knows the ropes. He knows exactly how it goes. He's strong. He's disciplined. He also bears most of the responsibility. That's what Jesus says. Take, and it, we're going to work this. Take a little while to get out this passage. So just bear with me. You can look at different angles of this. But this is one, very important one. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's what he wants us to do. Learn. He wants to, in effect, be our tutor. He wants to be our mentor. He wants to, he wants to share our burden. He wants to bear our yoke, so to speak. It's an important point. But what does he say in the midst of all of that? I will give you rest. Well, you don't yoke up and get rest unless you understand what how, how having the yoke could bring you rest. And we'll talk about that. Jesus promises two types of rest in this passage. Number one, rest from the heavy burden and yoke of the law. Peter said in Acts chapter 16, why would we, talk, talking about to the, to the um, in, um, in Acts 15 and 16 there at the uh, Jerusalem Council, he said, why would we put a heavy burden of the law upon these Gentiles that neither we nor our fathers who came before us were able to bear? Why would we yoke them up with a burden that would be so heavy as the law? Jesus says, come unto me, and I will give you rest from the law. It says, the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Boy, there's not much room for, not much margin of error with the law. You either do it or you die. Pretty serious. Jesus said, come unto me, and I will give you rest. I will give you freedom from the heavy burden of the law. And then also he says, I will learn of me and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your soul. That's an incredible word, which is that internal struggle of self effort that all of us, all of us deal with on an ongoing basis. It's this, this quest for self righteousness. We're all trying to earn it, all trying to deserve it. We come to Christ solely by grace through faith in Christ alone. And then immediately we start trying to earn our righteousness, start trying to make points with God, trying to get God's attention, trying to be God's favorite, so to speak, wanting God to, to, to be proud of us in some way. Warren Rearsby says, note the double use of the word rest. It's coming 
New King James, I will give you rest. This is the peace with God that comes with salvation. So as we're born again, Jesus says, I'm going to give you rest. And then notice, those that I've given rest, you will find rest. That takes us right back to what Murray said just a moment ago. Those that had been given rest, God gave Israel the promised land. He brought them all the way down to Kadesh Barnea. They saw, they, they, they testified that it was a land full of milk and honey. They said, we saw men carrying huge clusters of grapes that it took two men to carry. Everything God promised was exactly as he said it was. And yet they didn't have it. They didn't get it. They didn't enter into the land of rest. And the reason they didn't enter into the land of rest is because they didn't surrender. That's the whole point. That's what we're speaking so listen and again, notice the double use of the word rest. I will give you rest. This is the peace with God that comes with salvation. And you will find rest. This is the peace of God that comes with surrender. This full surrender. This, hold on to your seat. This deeper life. The deeper life. The deeper life. Marvin Vincent, who's a Greek scholar, says the rest of Christ is twofold. Given and found. This is what he says. It's pretty good. Given and found. It is given in pardon and reconciliation, what we just talked about. It is found under the yoke and the burden in the development of Christian experience. As more and more the strain passes over from self to Christ. You come to Christ all burdened down, and just like that, he saves us. And then we start wanting to bear and continue to carry all of our burdens. We want to stay in the wilderness, so to speak. And so there's this process. Murray talked about it. Wearsby talked about it. Now Vincent's talked about it. It's this, it's this surrender. It's this second rest that's so important. Now, I, I, pre I preached this for years. I heard of, this is not original to me. I heard of, I felt preach this many years ago from this passage. Really incredible word um, where Jesus said, I will give you rest. In other words, Jesus bears the burden. Well, it doesn't sound like it so far entirely because we start, we keep showing this picture. Uh, we got, we got a, a yoke on both sides, both these necks. I mean, it's incredible. He says, yoke up with me and I put this yoke around you. Oh, my goodness. As if I didn't already have a heavy enough load. But he's not putting the yoke around your neck so that you can bear his load. Although I must confess, I feel that all the time. I, I, it's it's self-inflicted, but I start, if I'm not careful, I start trying to carry the Lord's burden. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I love him and I want to do for him. I want to serve him with all of my heart. I want to, I, I live my whole life trying to give my life to him. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I've made lots of mistakes, but I've tried. I, my, my heart right. My heart is genuinely right. I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. I want to be where he wants me to be. I want to go where he, where he wants me to go. I want to be his. Sometimes I get confused as to, as to what's his yoke and mine. He wants to me to yoke up with him so that he can carry my burden. Think about it. This, this cart's got to be pulled. This plow has to be pulled. The Lord says, Hook up with me. I, I've used this for an example. One of the reasons I like this picture is because it had the arrow already in there. It didn't have to draw there. But here's the deal. If you look, and, and, and I'm not a farmer. I, I've, never, I've never put a yoke on an animal. But I will tell you this. I heard this guy preach, and, he, and, and some of you have heard me tell the story. Where it's it seems kind of strange when Jesus says, uh, Come unto me, all the that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you'll find rest. That doesn't seem quite right. And so he said he went to his uncle's farm. His mother... Um, I don't know if I told this story here. If I did last week, then forgive me, but I'll tell it quickly again. Um, in, in one of my classes, I think it was Thursday, but it doesn't matter. Re, you know, repetition breeds habit, habit success. So <laughs> bear with me. But what happens is, he said he was, it was his mother for summer, he got out of school. She sent him to his uncle's farm, thought it'd be good for him to work on the farm for a few weeks. He said, first day he got there, he said, he went to bed. He said, they woke him up like four o'clock in the morning. He said, I've never seen four o'clock in the morning before. He said it was incredible. Not only did he say they woke me up at 4 o'clock, he said the house smelled like breakfast. 
at four o'clock in the morning. He said, when you, they, they told him, get up, they've got to eat breakfast, they've got to go to work. Went down, he said, the whole table was just filled with biscuits and gravy and eggs and sauce and all the good kind of stuff, you know. He said, they ate. He said, they said, eat boy, eat boy, we got to work today. Then right after they finished breakfast, the uncle said, Sam, it wasn't even daylight yet. They went out to the barn and started, they started yoking up the mules. He said he brought that big mule out there and he said he put, he said, he said, here, let's put this mule, yoke on him. He said, and while he was working on that, he said the uncle brought this little skinny, scrawny mule out there. And, it, and the uncle started hooking the mule up to the other side of the yoke. And he said, he said, Uncle, we can't, we can't make this little scrawny mule work like that big mule that would kill him. And he said, and his uncle said, son, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, no, no, uncle, no, this is, look how scrawny he is. Look how big and strong this mule is. You can't put him beside him. He'll kill him. And he said, his uncle just kept fighting him. Finally, he said, listen, son, sit down. Let me tell you something. He said, if you'll notice that yoke, you got both animals are yoked up, but it depends on where you put, and I, I looked it up just so I remember this, can't remember the name after I couldn't remember last week. I can't remember the name of the of the the, the, the that you when you sell horses there'll be a, a shaft between them. He said depends on how close you put that shaft to the neck of the big animal. He said if you'll notice it's more on his side than it is on the other, because the one that gets the short end of the yoke is the one that pulls most of the load. The one on the long end of the yoke he's just kind of going along for the ride. You can imagine how that would be. The short end of the yoke means that he's the one that's pulling the, yoke, the, the load long ahead of the other one. He said, but here's the reason, son, because if I take this big mule out there and I'm, rode, and I'm working all by himself, by, by lunchtime, he's going to, psychologically, he's going to feel tired. And he's going to say, I've worked enough. You know, for, and he said, it'd be hard to get him to work the afternoon. He said, but if I bring another mule out there and put him beside him, no matter how big he is, and even though he's not really pulling much weight, he's just kind of going along for the ride. He said, the big mule will think, well, I got some help. And he said, he'll work all the way to five o'clock and he'll pull harder and work harder. He said, he's pulling all of the weight. That's how Jesus is with us. He says, come unto me, all you that are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What is his yoke? Stop and think about it. You could fit, you could fill in the blanks. I tell you what his yoke was. What, what burden did he bear? He bore the cross. He bore the cross. I don't have any holes in my hand. I don't have any holes in my side. I don't have any scars on my brow. Yet, he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you my yoke. Amen. I will give you what I carry. We're just going along for the ride. We're just yoked up to him. He's pulling all the weight. He's doing all the work. He's bearing all the burden. That's why he said, my burden is easy and my my, and, 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 um, and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's because he's carrying all the load. We yoke up with him. He's carrying all the burden. He's carrying all the burden. So when we walk, when we yoke up with Christ, we experience his rest. Lots of folks, the problem with lots of folks is they don't want to yoke up with anything. They're, you know, they're, they pull them, they're pulled them all their own selves up. They pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They're self-made men. We have a lot of those folks in America. Self-made man. The guy said to me one time, he said, I'm a self-made man. Anybody ever give me anything? He said, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I said, well, who gave you the bootstraps? <laughs> and the boots. And the ground that you put your boot on. It's incredible how it doesn't take but a moment till we can take away all of our human pride. Lots of folks, even in the church, they want to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They want to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They want to, they want to feel like they've done it. And so instead of, instead of entering into rest, they just, they just insist on earning it and deserving it themselves. We have to be yoked with Christ, experiencing his rest. Paul learned this the hard way. 
No doubt about it. He points it out in Philippians 3. He says, no, I'm out of also confidence in the flesh. In other words, self-effort. Look up the word flesh. I'm going to write this on the board. I think it's important. Um, you've seen this. I'm not going to go there and spend my whole class here because I, I talk about it a lot, but I think it's important. It goes right to the heart of most everything we talk about in the church. But the Greek word there is sarx. We see the word flesh. It's the Greek word sarx. It can, in minute cases, mean skin, but it's only occasionally that it picks up any connotation to that at all. Most time, most of the time, the word sarx is contrasted with the Greek word pneuma, which is where we get our word spirit from. So we contrast, like Paul does, if you walk in the pneuma, you won't fulfill the works, the lust of the sarx. If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Not skin, human nature. Not just human nature, self-effort. Self-effort. So SARS is self-effort. Or self-righteousness. Paul said, though I might have confidence in my own self-righteousness, in the flesh, if any other man thinks he hath breath, he might trust in the flesh, self-effort, I more. So, and he gives this whole list of accolades. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews that's touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he said, you want to talk about zeal? I persecuted the church. Boy, Paul was really in it. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, waste, refuse, manure, waste. I count them but dung that I might win Christ. That's what we're talking about a moment ago. All of my self-effort, me trying to carry my own burden, trying to, trying to do it myself, trying to you got to carry the yoke myself. Can't carry the yoke myself. That's why I'm, people are discouraged. That's why they, they don't understand the Christian life seems miserable to them. Miserable, they'll say. So when you start talking about, about yoking up with Jesus to enter into the deeper life, they don't want any part of that. They're just happy just to, you know, clock in at 11, number one, and, and drop their ties in, stand and sit three times, clock out at 11.59, be on the golf course 12.05, that's pretty much where a lot of the church is. They, they've exited out. They're wandering in the wilderness. They would tell you the Christian walk doesn't, doesn't match what the promise is. It's because they have not entered in, as, as Murray said just a moment ago. Paul said, I, I counted all my self-effort done that I might win Christ. Be found him not having mine own righteousness, which is in the law of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. In other words, yoked with him in his finished work. Amen. That's what rest occurs. That's what rest occurs. And it occurs on multiple levels. It occurs when you come to Christ and you have to you have to cast yourself at his feet in, in absolute humility and ask for mercy and forgiveness. But every moment of our walk with Christ is to be a, a walk of rest, a walk of surrender, a walk where we've yoked up with him and we now experience his rest, his finished work. We're yoked. Paul said that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. What does he mean? His finished work. That's what he means. That I might, Paul said, he was delivered, Romans 4 25, he was delivered to the cross for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. Paul said, I want to know him in both. I want to know him in the power of his death and reconciliation. I want to know him in the power of his resurrected life in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
Remember Romans 5 and 10? We quoted it. Ian Thomas, you're reading Ian Thomas. He quotes it over and over. If we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more, much more we shall be saved by his life. That saved by his life is this rest we're talking about here. It's entering into his rest, his life. As, as Ian Thomas. And Thomas says he steps into our humanity. When the Holy Spirit comes in to indwell us, we walk in the rest of God so that it's no longer I, but Christ that dwelleth in me. It's what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's not I that lives. It's Christ that lives within me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am yoked up with him, Paul said. So I'm dead. Amen. He lives in me. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. I want to know him not only in his death, in his death, but I want to know him in his resurrection. I want to know him in every aspect of his finished work. I want to walk in his rest. I want to not only abide with him, I want to abide in him. In him. He said, take my yoke and learn of me. Listen to what Andrew Murray says. Same book. This is out of his abiding Christ. This is what he said. He says, these two, this is a, this is a really stiff, winder, technical word here. So you've got to pay attention here. Sort of, or you're going to lose me on this one. Listen to what he says. He says, these two, consecration and faith, which is what we're talking about, are the essential elements of the Christian life. But when you hear those words, consecration, wow. You know, we've talked about before, when people hear faith now, we've made a, a faith of work now. Faith is not a non-work, it's now become a work. So when somebody says, I want to talk about faith today, go ahead, they're going to ask you for something. Probably money. Faith. You know, that's what everybody does. So you start, today we're talking about faith, everybody just grabs their wallet because they're you know, going to give us. In other words, faith is all about doing something to them. In other words, faith is a work. Something they're going to earn or work or for or deserve. Go look it up again. Faith isn't, isn't a work. Faith, faith is, is a trust. It's an entrusting of myself unto Jesus. <clears throat> when you hear the word consecration, consecration, that sounds a lot like that word sanctification. Whew. Hey boy, that ain't tell what that's going to cost me. Whew. That'll cost me. I'll have to give up this, give up that, and give up the other thing. That's immediately when I hear the word consecration. I grew up in and a hold them in church. And when I hear the word consecration, immediately like, oh, oh, it's going to be painful because they're going to make me give up something. <laughs> make me give up something. <laughs> consecration. Don't think of consecration as you earning or deserving or accomplishing something. Think of consecration as the word sanctification really means. If you look it up, Think about it, the word holy. God said, be ye holy as I am holy. The word holy, look at up. This is what it means. I know it means pure and clean and all that. But listen to this. Look at that. In its pure sense, it's separate. Separate. Distinct. Be ye separate. Unto me. Come out from among the world, be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll be a father unto you. That's, that's God's call. Be separated. Separated unto me. When the angels flying around in the midst of the, of the Lord in Isaiah's day, when they saw the Lord, these seraphim, what did they say? They said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. They carry the third level of supremacy. I'm talking about so much here. So it means if you say something three times, you can say it a million times. It wouldn't matter. Saying it three times is as if you equivalent if you said it a trillion times. He is so holy. What do they mean? He is so distinct. He is so separate from us. That's what Isaiah said. Woe is me. When he saw that, he said, Woe is me from a man of unclean lips, dwelling among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah said, I don't even know anybody. Isaiah was a prophet, had been working with Uzziah up until that day, until Uzziah died. And then he says, And here King Uzziah died, I, saw, I also saw the Lord. And when he saw the Lord, he said, Oh my goodness. You know what? Isaiah probably thought he was doing pretty good until he saw the Lord. And he said, I am undone. 
Whoa, that's catastrophe. Whoa is me. Anybody's ever gotten the presence of the Lord, that's what they said, because God is so holy, so separate, so distinct from us. He's so unlike us. So when those angels fly around, what they're saying is, oh my goodness, he's unlike us. Oh my goodness, he is so distinct. That's that word, consecration. Consecration means to be separate. Dedicated on him. So listen to what Murray says. These two, sanctification or consecration, I should say, in faith, are the essential elements of the Christian life. The giving up all to Jesus, the receiving all from Jesus. The giving up all to Jesus, the receiving all from Jesus. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but it's not I, but Christ that lives within me. That's it. They are implied in each other. They are united in one word, surrender, surrender. A full surrender is to obey as well as to trust. To trust as well as obey. With such misunderstanding at the outset, it is no wonder that the disciples' life was not one of such joy or strength as had been hoped. In some things, you were led into sin without knowing it because you had not learned how holy Jesus wanted to rule you and how you could not keep right for a moment unless you had him very near you. Other things you knew what sin was, but had not the power to conquer because you did not know or believe how entirely Jesus would take charge of you and keep you to help you. Either way, Murray says, it was not long before the bright joy of your first love was lost. I see it all the time. And your path, instead of being like the path of the just, shining more and more into the perfect way, became like Israel's wandering in the desert. Ever on the way, never very far, and yet always coming short of the promised land. Weary soul, since so many years uh, driven to and fro like the panting heart or deer, oh, come and learn this day the lesson that there is a spot where safety and victory, where peace and rest are, are always sure, and that spot is always open to thee, the heart of Jesus. But alas, I hear someone say, it is just this abiding in Jesus, always bearing his yoke, to learn of him that is so difficult and the very effort to attain to this often disturbs the rest even more than sin or the world. It's work, they say. Oh, they missed the whole point. What a mistake to speak thus, Murray says. And yet how often the words are heard. Does it weary, question here, does it weary the traveler to rest in the house or on the bed where he seeks repose from his fatigue? Well, it doesn't work. When I hit the bed, I don't remember anything else. The bed's doing all the work. Think about it. Or is it a labor to a little child to rest in his mother's arms? does everything. Is it not the house that keeps the traveler within the shelter or the arms of the mother sustain and keep the little one? And so it is with Jesus. The soul has but to yield itself to him. In other words, we've got to lay in his arms. We have to lay on the bed, so to speak. He said, so notice again, the soul that uh, has but to yield itself to him to be still and rest in the confidence that his love has undertaken and that his faithfulness will perform the work of keeping, his faithfulness will perform the work of keeping it safe in the shelter of his bosom. Oh, it is because the blessing is so great that our little hearts cannot rise to apprehend it. It is as if we cannot believe that Christ, the Almighty One, will in very deed teach and keep us all the day. And yet this is just what he has promised. Just like Israel standing on the brink of the promised land. And they said, it's exactly what God said. It's a land full of milk and honey. And yet we saw the giants there. And, and they're bigger than us. And in our eyes, we were like grasshoppers unto them. Oh my goodness, isn't it incredible? Incredible. Murray says it, it is as our heart takes in this truth that when he says abide in me, learn of me, he really means it. And that is his own work to keep us abiding when we yield. I mean, he's going to read again. And, and that it is his own work to keep us abiding when we yield ourselves to him. Somebody says, well, how's he going to do it? Glad you asked. 
indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In John 15, we haven't got there. We'll eventually get over there. John 15, Jesus said, I want you to abide with me. I and you. You and me. He said to the disciples, I'm going to be leaving, but don't you be afraid. They were afraid. They were tore up about it, remember? I'm going to be leaving, but don't you be afraid. I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to give you another comfort. The word another is allos. One just like me. It means of like kind. Look it up in any strong concordance or any other Greek lexicon. Allos, Greek word. Another. One just like me. I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to give you another comforter who will do. And the word comforter is an incredible word. One called alongside to help. One called alongside to help. One called alongside is the most important part of that. He's called alongside. He's our yoke. He yokes up with us. I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to give you another comforter, one just like me. One that's going to help you. One that's going to call alongside of you. He not only, he says the world won't be able to receive him because they can't see him, but you will receive him because he not only dwells with you right now, but he's going to dwell in you. That's how he's going to do it. Amen. That's how he's going to do it. It's Christ in you. I in him. He in me. This abiding in Christ. So, so Murray says it is his own work to keep us abiding when we yield ourselves to him that we shall venture to cast ourselves into the arms of his love and abandon ourselves to his blessed keeping. It is not the yoke, but the resistance to the yoke that makes the difficulty. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a good word. How is it Murray comes up with all this good stuff? Amen. <laughs> Think about it. It's a good word. It is not the yoke resistance to the yoke that makes the difficulty. The wholehearted surrender to Jesus as at once our master and our keeper finds and secures the rest. Come, my brother, and let us this very day commence to accept the word of Jesus in all simplicity. It is a distinct command, this take my yoke and learn of me, abide in me. A command has to be obeyed. Tis mine to obey, tis his to provide. Good word. Let us this day in immediate obedience accept the command and answer boldly. Savior, I abide in thee. At thy bidding, I take thy yoke. I undertake the duty without delay. I abide in thee. Let each consciousness of failure only give new urgency to the command. Somebody says, well, I, I did that and I failed. That's what he's saying. He's addressing you right now. He's addressing me. Let each consciousness of failure only give new urgency to the command and teach us. Is that what he said? <laughs> Come unto me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. And teach us to listen more earnestly than ever till the Spirit again give us to hear the voice of Jesus saying, with a love and authority that inspire both hope and obedience, child, abide in me. That word listen, list, listen, that word listen as to as coming from himself will be an end of all doubting. I, I, I botched that. That word listen to as coming from himself will be an end of all doubting. A divine promise of what shall surely be granted. And with ever increasing simplicity, its meaning will be interpreted. Abiding in Jesus is nothing but the giving up of oneself to, the, to be ruled and taught and led and so resting. To surrender. Remember what Paul said to the Galatians? Are you so foolish? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect in the flesh? Well, that's a good question. Because I see people all the time. They get born again by grace through faith in Christ alone, not of works, that's what you should boast. And then the rest of their walk with God is a walk of work and agony trying to earn and trying to deserve righteousness, trying to win the approval of the Lord. Paul says, are you so foolish to think that what begun solely with the Lord and the Spirit could now be made perfect in the flesh? Lots of folks are trying it. That's why they're miserable. That's why they have not come to the place of rest. They're still wandering in the wilderness. 
Canaan is right before them. Remember what he said a moment ago? Always near and yet never coming in to Canaan, to the land of rest. Now, last week, <clears throat> hang on to your seat. I gave you a word from Francois Finland. I got to bring him back again today. Amen. <laughs> Francois <laughs> Finland. That's a tough. I've been reading him. I got you know a couple of his books at the same time. Tamara and I were out walking the other day. We're avid walkers. Amen. Uh, we decided we, we're going to walk. <laughs> and so we were walking. Let me do that. And we were walking, but we kind of power walk, you know, we're in a hurry. Um, I have one goal in mind, getting back to the car. And so we, we were walking, you know, and I, and I had Finland on. And Tamara said, let, let me hear Finland in a little while. And so I, I had him on my phone. And so I just unplugged. I said, I said okay, listen to Finland. I said, but hang on to your seat because Finland's tough. And boy, was he tough. Tamara said, wow. <laughs> wow. So listen to Finland. He talks about this abandonment. That's what resting in Jesus is, Finland says. Listen, he says, abandonment is not a heroic sacrifice. That's what we tend to think. Well, I'm going to abandon myself to God. I'm going to get my name in lights. I'm going to preach the gospel all over the world. Thousands and thousands of people. You know, that's right. We tend to make it work. Finland says it's not a work. Abandonment is not a work. He said it's not a heroic sacrifice, but a simple sinking into the will of God. Merely just just surrendering. Just coming under his yoke. That's what, he, that's what he means. Putting on his yoke. Yoking up with him who paid all the cross on Calvary. Who then died resurrected. Prayed the Father. Send his Holy Spirit back. And it's now the fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruit of Curtis Wood. It's not even the fruit of my human spirit. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit indwelling in my newly created spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the sons of God. Hmm. He paid it all. He paid it all. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more we shall be saved. It's an incredible surrender. So listen, he says, when I'm weak, says the apostle, let me read the whole thing again. But abandonment is not a, her a heroic sacrifice, but a simple sinking, sinking into the will of God. When I'm weak, says the apostle, then I'm, am I strong? Strength is made perfect in weakness. We are only strong in God in proportion as we are weak in ourselves. Your feebleness will, will be your strength if you accept it in all, lo in all, uh, in all lowliness. Humility. We are tempted to believe that weakness and lowliness or humility are incompatible with abandonment because this latter abandonment is represented as a generous act of the soul by which it testifies its great love and makes the most heroic sacrifices. That's what the church rewards. Works. We reward works. You know, it's how we do. But a true abandonment, Finland says, is a simple resting in the love of God. As an infant, use the same terminology that Andrew Murray does, as an infant lies in his mother's arms. There can be no greater support than a consciousness that we are wholly given up. Once I know that I'm wholly given up, that I have now surrendered myself to you, Lord, that I am yours, that I've been delivered, um, that you were delivered under the cross of my offenses, raised for my justification, and therefore I just cast myself solely on your graces, Lord. Once I have wholly given up, and it's not about me, he says there's no greater support. He said abandonment consists not in doing great things for self to take delight in, but simply in suffering our weaknesses and infirmity and letting everything alone, giving up. It is peaceful, for it would no longer be sincere if we were still reckless about anything we had renounced. I read again. It is peaceful, for it would no longer be sincere if we were still reckless, restless about anything we had renounced. It is this, it is thus that abandonment is the source of true peace. If we have not peace, it is because our abandonment is exceedingly imperfect. Wow, that's a hard word. That's a sharp word. Now, I want to go to Hebrews chapter 4. 
and I wanted to go to Hebrews chapter 4 last week. And I wanted to go to Hebrews chapter 4 the week before that. And so I, I keep getting back. I keep putting it at the end of my lesson. I guess I'm going to have to start in Hebrews chapter 4 and eventually get there. We'll have to cover it later because I want to give you one story and then I want to discuss it with whatever balance of time we have left. You're reading Ian Thomas. And Ian Thomas tells a story, uses this analogy. I've heard him use it many times. He uses the analogy of, he actually uses two. He uses, I'll give you one quickly and I'll, I may give you the other one if time permits. He uses the one of an automobile. One of, he illustrates it better in one of the books I was reading or, or listening to him, I believe. And he said, what if you go on the road and you see this lady and she's sitting on the side of the road and and she and her car's broke down, her hood's up, she's got a hanky on the outside of the, of the, of the uh, car. And you pull in there and you say, what's wrong with your car? She says, I don't, I don't know, it won't start. And then you discover that she has no gas. So he says, so you, you give her a tow. You, you, you push her or pull her down to the gas station and he said, and you, you gas her car up for her. And he said, you say, okay, you start the car and it starts right up. And you say, okay, see you later. And you pull out of the gas station. And as you start down the road, you look in your rearview mirror and she's pushing the car out of the parking lot. He said, the car's there, the motor's there, the transmission's there, the gas is there. And she still insists on pushing the car. People are. That's what a lot of people are. We're still pushing the car. We're not. We're not rested. We haven't. We haven't come unto Him. We haven't, in effect, cast ourselves at His feet. We haven't taken His yoke. We're trying to carry the load ourselves. It's easy to do, and I fall under it all the time. I find myself getting caught up in the yoke. I find myself with responsibilities, and I'm. A, generally a responsible type person and so therefore I take things on me that um, that really I haven't even no control over because I, I want to I want to make it happen I think I think there's an element of that that's good I think you know the ministry is about faith anointing and hard work <laughs> so if you got the first two and you don't get the third one you're going to have a very unsuccessful ministry you're going to have to go do the ministry he said go into all the world and preach the gospel but we go in his grace. What does he go on to say? Preach the gospel. And then he goes on to say, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. So he doesn't want us to go on our own. He wants us to go in him. It's easy. It's easy to, to start trying to bear our own burdens, carry our own load, and carry load, the load that he's supposed to carry, try to earn or deserve before the Lord. And God's calling us to rest. We're going to get there in Hebrews chapter 4. Jesus said, I will give you rest. Are you resting? Am I resting? We have to ask ourselves that question. And if not, we have to move into the deeper life. Move into the deeper life, which is that life of just surrender, just giving ourselves to Christ. I am totally out of time. I'm going to quit. So say, say a prayer, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to open up and we'll discuss it. For those of you that are joining us, stick around. If you, even if you're a guest, stick around because we're going to, we're going to talk just for a moment. If, say as long as you can. But let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your spirit. I feel the anointing of God in this room. Felt your presence the entire evening, God. I know that your anointing is here. I know your grace is here. Lord, you give us the long end. You take the short end. You did all the suffering on Calvary. You do all the work today. You've given us the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering. It's, it's you, Lord. It's you. Help us, Father, to remember that it's Christ in us the hope of glory, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels or clay pots. Help us, Lord, to remember it's you, not us. It's you. Help us to enter into that rest. Lord, help us to get out of the wilderness and instead of wandering around. And Lord, help us to get out of the wilderness and move into Canaan. Help us to be willing, Lord. I pray for everyone that's listening right now. I pray that the Spirit of God minister to them. And Lord, that they would experience the fullness of your rest, the fullness of your joy. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God.